Today is Wednesday, July 1st, 2020, at 1 o'clock p.m. I'm standing in the morgue at the Fiesta Tableware Company in Knoll, West Virginia. Now, I'm making this video for the HLCCA, and I was back here in February and did a little bit of cleanup and some organization of this room uh, with the intention of presenting a video at the conference as a surprise. But because of COVID, uh, we're not having the conference this year, so I'm doing this uh, online. Uh, one of the benefits of this is that I can do a longer video. Um, and even though you know this is going to be seen by a lot of people, it is being made with the HLCCA in mind and with the uh, members in mind. So first of all, what is the morgue? The morgue is a room where pieces of experimentals, shop samples, discontinued items are put in storage. And I'm going to go through this room today and show you as many different examples as I can. So we'll start over here at the beginning. And I want to begin by showing what an R number is, because this is going to come up quite a bit. So this is a Virginia Rose plate, and we have a decal treatment with platinum trim. And on the back we see R6120. So that's a reference number or research number. Now, had this pattern been approved, it would have gotten an official treatment number. Um, for example, we have one here. This is a rather common treatment on the Virginia Rose shape. This is a decal test, and it has its official treatment number at the bottom, VR135. So if you hear me talk about R numbers or reference numbers, that's what I mean, these special numbers uh, that were used for identification purposes before things were approved. So we'll begin with some Brittany plates um, with some plaid treatments. These were probably applique treatments because they all date from the 1950s. They have a, a raised effect to them. They might even be Duraprint. There's not too much information on these. Um, the one beside it, this Cala Rose decal, we see a lot with an underglaze um, treatment along the rim. Uh, old Famous Ships is a line they worked on. Uh, this is on swing eggshell, but it was used on other shapes. You see this border with the seashells. Uh, let's look at the marking. Because the marking usually has uh, the subject matter, in this case, California Clipper. Here's your marking. Famous Old Ships by Homer Laughlin. Beside it, we see two treatments that uh, we often find on swing eggshell. We've got uh, Chinese Buddha and the Green Goddess. But here they're given these uh, sort of like willow borders. So there's one in green and one in red. And we'll look at the back of this one because it might have an R number as well. And it does. It is R3435A from 1940. And then next we have um, a standard treatment. This is just a decal test for uh, tulips and basket on Virginia Rose with red trim. And then there's Pueblo and Mexicana on swing eggshell. Some decal tests on Virginia Rose. And this is a nice little plate. This is a Fiesta Old Ivory plate with decal and blue trim. You normally do not see decals on Fiesta, but this was factory done. And it has an R number as well. R2186 in gold. At the top are some Tango plates. Those are standard production pieces. We'll be talking about Tango in a little bit. Um, there's a, an experimental treatment on Brittany with its underglazed silk screen border with decals. And then we have some willow treatments in blue and brown. Now, this is not the standard blue willow that was made by Homer Laughlin. From, they made a, a pattern from the 1930s all the way into the 1960s. We have an example here to show. This is your standard blue willow treatment. So this is a variation. I'll try to put them side by side so you can see them. So there's your blue and your brown version. And this is a, a sporting scenes plate. We'll be looking at some more of these uh, later on as we get through the room. And these are Courier and Ive prints. So red, blue, and this is a, a hunting scene. We'll look at the marking on this one. It says, uh, American Subjects from Courier and Ives, Homer Lachlan, Woodcock Shooting, from 1941, and R15-1995. 
Early American Homes in Red, that was a standard uh, item that was made for J.C. Penney. But here's one in a brown body uh, with a brown print, so that is not standard. And then we see some Paul Revere plates. We have like a mulberry color. Forgive me if I have to keep moving to get, to get the uh, light to, so it doesn't reflect that much. There's a mulberry, there's a brown, and then there's a light purple. And then we see the same center print on theme eggshell. And we can look at the back of the theme eggshell plate. Early America by Homer Lachlan, Made in USA, Paul Revere, R15, 1886. Now we'll look at some casseroles uh, very quickly because Nautilus, which comes from 1936, has uh, shell handles, shell finials, and shell feet, but they had some variations going on. So you see this one with the shell handles and shell finial, but a solid foot. Uh, you see these ones with the more curled handles and finials. We go over here, we've got our little scroll feet that we would normally see with these more ornate handles and finials. And then again, we see shell handles and finials with a solid foot. Then we see the solid foot with the ornate uh, handles. So they had lots of variations for the Nautilus casserole until they finally decided on the scroll feet and the uh, shell handles and finials. Uh, we've got some shop samples up top. There's a W6833 on the well shape with vellum glaze and a encrusted uh, platinum trim. And then some Brittany examples. These should be familiar, especially this one. This is Majestic, made for Woolworths. Uh, another Woolworth treatment up top using the Quaker shape. These are rather interesting. They're uh, Brittany silkscreen treatments that you see in pink and this sort of an orange color on this one. But the decals come from Virginia Rose and it's a, a little unusual to see uh, decals on Brittany in conjunction with silkscreen where the decal extends into the well of the plate. Usually they're going to look like that where they're limited to the rim and then you have a center sprig. Um, so these were kind of fun to, to encounter. Another Brittany silkscreen treatment. Uh, this is a rather old piece. This comes from about 1920. Uh, this little uh, black and yellow treatment. It was also made in green and yellow. That's a Genesee plate. Now I want to talk about craft blue. This is a standard item that was made in 1937 and extends all the way to the 1950s. It's a rim shape with a rope border and it's made in blue clay. So if you were to break this you would see the blue through and through. Well there are a couple pieces beside it. We have hand painted work on this particular example and then we have the standard blue willow underglaze decoration on this one. Well they also made a coop shape that is without a rim but it has the rope border and we see that here. And um, those come from fruit skin glazes, which we're going to talk about here in a little bit. But I want to focus on these plates in particular, because there's a whole series of them that were drawn up um, by Charles Williams. And the top we see one that's called uh, Concept of Paradise. We see that in this orange and blue and green and tan. And then we see these other designs. Some of them are, say, Swedish modern on the back of them. So we have all these different color combinations. This is a rather nice, sort of a Tudor rose type treatment. Has almost a raised effect on some of these. And then we see the bird. And the ducks. Several of those. And the flowers. Another modern treatment. And this one in particular I want to show because it has some good information on the back. And it says, you know, it has some uh, color combinations, you know, dark beige. It says uh, drawing number 3044, July 24th, 1941, CW. So that's Charles Williams, um, who did a lot of work, uh, artwork, for like Brittany and all your underglaze treatments. So he did all these plates. I'll just pan through very quickly one more time. So they're rather impressive. None of these, of course, went into production. And then we've got a matte black serenade teacup. Correction, that's glossy. That one's matte. And then we have a brown 
Yellowstone teacup, and then a matte black Wells teacup. Sort of like the Wells Art glazes where they're, they're all those matte finishes. Uh, a Brittany teacup in a sort of a tan body with this uh, laurel print on it. And we've got some uh, century teacups. So this is a slightly different base than we're used to seeing with Century, and a more curved handle. And then we see another version with a squared off handle on the bottom portion. And then we have the standard Century teacup with this rather unusual platinum design. A couple rectangle casseroles. This one's in white body and this one's in vellum. It's a really nice glaze on this one. Some standard casseroles, there's Coronet, Andover Eggshell, Empress, Quaker. And I want to show this one for a moment. This is sort of a, let's see, there's one hand here. It's like oven serve almost, but look at the marking. It's kind of hard to see. But the top of it says Homer, and then it says Hotco, H-O-T-C-O, -O, and then Lachlan at the bottom. Really nice uh, embossing on this. I'm not sure if that's going to show up too well in the video. Then we have Modern Farmer, which was made for Sears. Well, initially made for Sears, and they took it over from the James River Potteries. And then we see Modern Farmer in Rose, which would have been available at the time on uh, Harlequin. We'll take the lid off and look at the inside. You see the same type of embossing going on. Then we have a scallop uh, salad bowl. So these aren't uncommon, you know, with a decal, but this has a, a fruit malt molded in the inside to it. So that comes from the 1930s, glazed in yellow. But the standard scallop. Uh, Salad nappy would, would just have a plain bottom and have a decal and then maybe a, a, an airbrush trim uh, and then just a clear glaze. So we'll go back over here for a moment because I want to talk about the Betty Crocker bowls from 1940. Some of you may have some of these that were issued in the contemporary line. You may have the model numbers on you. They do. 1524 on this one. And the other one is uh, 1529. They vary only slightly, those particular examples. But there were two others. And we have this one, which is 1514, which is much taller, a little bit smaller diameter, but it's almost conical in shape. And we have another one here. This is in uh, Harlequin Blue. And then we have a final version. This is 1515, but it has three little feet. So these were alternates to the Betty Crocker bowls um, with its three feet or with its taller appearance until they finally decided on these turquoise versions. You will either find this in turquoise or harlequin yellow. Then we have some uh, sample glazes. So they like to use wells uh, six inch plates on their sample glazes. We see some in the art glaze, dark green. They all have identification numbers on the back. There's a pastel green. Nice little uh, Harlequin trowel glaze, 2519 for maroon. Another maroon glaze. So there, there's stacks and stacks of these. Uh, there's your rust art glaze. We'll just look at a couple of these real quick. I can stop and take a little breather. There's a nice pink one. Sometimes you can find Fiesta trial glazes where the number is written under a glaze just like a, this one. Like a, be in like a, a dark uh, glaze color. Another rust. There's quite a few rust uh, trials in here. So that's 
that's a little bit about trial glazes. Using the Wells 6 inch plates. That seemed to be their go to shape for the uh, trial glazes. Let's see if there's a And then we have some uh, saucers, just some coupe shaped saucers, some different colors. There's Harlequin Blue, Yellow, Fiesta Red. I don't know if that's going to show up as red in this video. I don't have the best lighting in here today, so if I say it's Fiesta Red and it doesn't look Fiesta Red, it, a it actually is. Another Wells 6 inch plate. Nice little design on the front. We've got some information on the back. DP, we might see that on some uh, plates as we move along. That stands for Decal Products, which was in East Liverpool. And they supplied a lot of decals, area potteries. This, we're going to be seeing more of these. Um, this hand-painted work. So we'll move on. There's a little... Um, Riviera printer's block that would be used for like newspaper advertising so it's in reverse Liberty shape with uh, a wheat decal I've never seen this treatment before uh, it has an R number on the back of it but these are these are standard Liberty treatments let's move this back up Probably all decal tests. And we see our uh, sports scene again. This one's in brown, brown body with uh, a brown print. Old sports scenes by Homer Lachlan. Again with our ships. This has a shell border, but this is not, this is, feels like, um, might be Brittany. 1940, old famous ships. Another old famous ships. This one is uh, San Martin, and this is on eggshell Nautilus, and it's got an R number at the top. There's your California Clipper. It only seems to be two ships, but they did vary the borders. And here's one in green uh, California Clipper, eggshell Nautilus from 1941. A little uh, Wells Art Glaze tray on the bottom. Another Courier and Ives, uh, American Subjects Courier and Ives. This one is what? Uh, the saucer is, it says the pool, and then the cup, which I don't have a cup to show you, is, is New York Harbor. We have our little reference number on there. Tango plate glazed in this uh, nice caramel color with uh, decal. And I thought this was unusual. This is Duraprint. You normally would not see uh, a treatment this elaborate in Duraprint. I did a video on Duraprint not too long ago and talked about these late treatments. This one's dated 1959. Uh, it looks more like an underglazed print than a Duraprint pattern. Put these back. Tudor Rose, which was made for Quaker Oats. Uh, this is a nice little carafe. I think some of you are going to recognize this process, this uh, little resist that was done. Um, they did this on the horizon mugs or fan mugs as they're sometimes called, but here it is on this rose carafe, all the way on mid-body. Now this jug is model number 1050, and it comes from 1938, I believe. It might even have the model number on it. Done in Fiesta Red. It does. I don't know if you can see it. It's 1050. So that did not go into production. Unusual piece. And then we have model number, um, let's see, this is 423. This is a Fiesta cracked ice bowl. Now when Huxfords wrote about the morgue, they showed this piece, along with the footed French casserole. The footage French casserole is in the uh, museum at the outlet, but this is still here up in the morgue. It's essentially a nested bowl with a foot. 
uh, not marked, but since it was made in 1935, had this gone into production, it would have been one of the original assort, or, uh, pardon me, it would have been one of the original items in the Fiesta assortment. So now, I want to talk about Theme Eggshell, because this is rather interesting what they did. Theme Eggshell, which was released around 1939, it has this fruit border that we see. It's part of the mold. And we have a theme eggshell marking here. This one's from 1941. And this is what we would expect to see with theme eggshell. And we have a theme eggshell teacup. But that's not how it started out. In uh, 1938, from September to November, what they did is they took an eggshell nautilus plate and Frederick Reed himself modeled this border using blue slip. They had that craft blue that was being made so they had the blue clay to do this. Then they applied it to the plain uh, nautilus eggshell plate and then gave it a clear glaze. And the idea was to copy Wedgwood or Jasper ware. And uh, this was almost a fully realized line. They've got uh, eight inch plates and Brim soups. They even made a casserole with a blue finial. They made all sorts of teacups. So we, we see it here with the applied blue border or grape fruit border. We see it in pink. They even did it in green. Let's uh, come down here and you can see it. We see the swing eggshell handles done in green. We see another swing eggshell type cup with the same border. Here it is again in pink. But before they continued this line, they just changed it completely. And instead of having this applied um, blue pattern, they just made it part of the mold and then just gave it a, a, just a plain eggshell glaze. And that was it. Um, so I don't know if it was an issue of cost prohibitive because it does seem like it would have taken a lot longer to produce this type of wear where you're applying all this by hand and then giving it a clear glaze. There are several sizes uh, or styles of cups, and then there's, as I said, there's all sorts of plates and platters. Uh, they're tucked away, but I did pull these out so you can get an idea of what the original concept for theme eggshell was. And we see uh, theme eggshell glazed in solid green. Here's a theme eggshell cup in pink body with a clear glaze. I think there's a blue body one here too. Yeah. So it's sort of like craft blue, but it's steam egg shell. Okay, moving on. We have a little hot water pitcher, or hot water teapot as it's sometimes called. It's model number 545. It comes from February 1936. There are several of these that have been found in the open market. There's a red one and an ivory one. There's another cobalt one. There's one in here that's in rose ebony, but it, it, it's missing its lid really heavy piece. Um, let's see what the bottom, it might have a model number on it. Let's see if it does. And it does not. Somewhat inferior glaze on this particular example. But that is your hot water bottle. Or your hot water teapot as it's listed in the modeling log. Then we have Georgian oven serve. Now, Georgian oven serve came about at the same time as embossed oven serve in the early 1930s. And we see the French casserole here. This is model number 239, which comes from uh, 1934. So we see our typical Georgian uh, you know, dash dot embossing that we would find on Georgian dinnerware, whether it be Craftsman or Georgian eggshell. And we have some of these meat platters again with this Georgian embossing, but it has this cut out well to catch grease. And this one's in your orange or pumpkin, if you will. And then there's melon yellow, your two uh, oven serve colors. All right, at the top, we've got some uh, Brittany plates with underglazed treatments. On the end, that's actually a standard production that was used on Piccadilly. So these were all underglazed silk screens. And then we have W5923. This is Red Beauty. This is very popular with collectors. Uh, you can find this on Wells and, uh, let's see, Chelsea, Virginia Rose, several uh, Homer Lachlan shapes. But here's an unusual version. It's swing eggshell with this yellow shoulder. 
and black encasing lines, and we see the Red Beauty decal. A couple more shop samples using uh, Wells Vellum W6433 and W7733. And then we have an art glaze uh, plate. But this gold stamp was used on vellum and made for Montgomery Ward. So here's a nice interesting variation. Some more shop samples, W9223. And then we have a pair of swing eggshell plates with this uh, fan and mask, uh, sort of like a masquerade, if you will, decal. Um, we see this treatment also in, um, in the morgue. It's used on uh, theme eggshell as well. Let's see if there's any information on this one. So this is 1937, and we have our R number again, R8553. Back. And we've got these scallop plates, which are rather nice because the embossing that's on the verge is very similar to what was used on Coronet. We'll look at Coronet in a minute. But we have Harlequin blue, we have yellow, we have this nice brown color, and then we have the embossing that has been hand-painted under the glaze. A couple art glaze trays, this one in leaf green, and this one's in a pastel blue. It may be serenade, it's hard to tell, um, because it's a rather heavy application. Usually serenade's a little bit thinner. Um, you can find an example of uh, this plate in Huxford's book on their section of art glazes, and that's the only other place I've ever seen one of these. There's a couple in the morgue, there's one in ivory, there's also a yellow one. This is a swing eggshell plate with embossing detail. Rather unusual rhythm teacup in this sort of brownish red glaze. And this is one of the uh, early versions of uh, Nautilus with its uh, very deco styled handle. Some Fiesta ironstone, there's casserole and some creamers. Uh, sauce boat, medium green harlequin sauce boat. Granada shakers. This was a fun thing to find um, because Jo Cunningham shows this lid in her book and all she does is show the lid. Now this particular treatment uh, you can find on the Wells shape and this has a nice back stamp. It says uh, Wells Knoll USA. It has the Knoll Bridge. Um, but I was able to find the base that goes with it. Unfortunately it's in, in pretty bad condition but it has that same uh, Knoll Bridge back stamp. But it was nice to see what the base with the lid looks like. So there's a good shot of it there for you. And uh, some standard treatments up top using Brittany. Uh, I think one of those is Royal Splendor. This is a pattern that was made for Woolworth using the Empress shape. Uh, Underglaze Brittany. Black Tulip, a very popular treatment. This is the shop sample W7, I'm sorry, 6733 with platinum trim. Some more shop samples, another one on using Wells Vellum. This one, uh, sort of this Asian theme on swing eggshell. And these swirl plates, well, look at a yellow one. I don't have any information on these swirl plates. Um, we're going to see a couple more in a minute, uh, a decaled version, and that one's in Serenade Blue. And then we see another well shop sample. This is the Angelus shape, uh, 9983, so this uh, underglazed blueprint. It's rather unusual to see the Angelus in here. Most of the items in this room come from Frederick Reed's time and Don Schreckengoss' time, so this comes from about 1906 or so. Another well shop sample, as is this one, W7133. This is sometimes called Wild Rose, found on Virginia Rose, as well as other shapes like uh, Yellowstone. Um, this is a kitchen craft lid. Rather unusual in that it has this silk screen treatment. Usually kitchen craft does not have silk screen treatments. It's pretty much going to be decals or solid colors in the form of Fiesta kitchen craft. So this is rather unusual to see silk screen. You, this is something you'd normally find on Brittany or Piccadilly. Now, this is a fun piece. This is trellis. But in between the trellis designs, because there's one trellis design there and there's another trellis design here, you see the birds. And then there's some uh, floral treatments. So the panels in between the trellis uh, embossings have, have been filled in. 
This is Coronet. I was talking about this embossing before. Um, that is very similar. We'll jump back very quickly to the embossing on the scallop plates. So this is the sea green glaze that was made for Coronet. Um, to its right is an alternate version. It does not have the uh, same flower embossing. It just has this laurel type embossing and slightly different uh, panels. And then we have two pastel plates. Um, these little triangle embossings here, and a little different configuration on this plate. Both experimental, of course. And then there's a corresponding teacup with the same sawtooth embossing on the bottom. That's done in vellum. I was talking about those swirl plates a minute ago. Here's one with the cow treatments on it. Another R number, R3057. There's a yellow one. So we'll jump back over here real quick because this uh, has a little sticker on it that says Experimental Work, Cone 11, Crystalline Glazes, FHR, Frederick Horton Reed. So we see quite a few of these samples of these reactive glazes. Uh, there's some jade, the square shape, and then the rest of them are wells. So we'll just uh, stop for a moment and look at a couple of these. You get these random patterns based on how they reacted during firing. We'll look at some of the wells examples. Piccadilly casserole, we'll move that over. Some of you may remember the uh, crystalline glazes that were used on Fiesta vases not too long ago. While I was here I asked how that was done and they said it was, a, it was during firing uh, the zinc reacting and creating uh, all these effects. So I imagine this was the same idea for these vintage pieces. And since we're talking about wells and jade, that's a nice one, this would have been done uh, probably mid-1930s or early 1930s. And all of them have identification on the back there. In fact, they're bisque on the reverse. Which they would have had all their, their numbers for identification. So that's enough of that for now. Um, you know, here's the saucer that goes with our scallop shape, which I, I still don't know what that is. They made a lot of different um, experimental shapes in the 30s um, with embossing details. We're going to see uh, several cups here in a little bit. So now uh, we're at apple tree bowls. So we have an example here. This is a large version from the 1940s in light green and then there's one in rose. There's a full set in melon yellow. But I want to talk about these in particular because this little version, you look at it and it looks like an apple tree bowl. It has that yellow glaze. It's very typical but it says made in Japan. And our large version that's inside, be very careful here, says made in Japan as well. And in the 1930s, particularly 1934, there were all these Japanese imports that were copying Homer Lachlan wares and we see an oven serve uh, mixing bowl with our rose and poppy embossing and it says made in Japan and we have a coronet saucer. Well the sticker's hiding it, but it says made in Japan on that one. And then we have another saucer, you look at that, it looks very much like the Orleans shape by Homer Lachlan, but we turn it over and it says made in Japan. So it's interesting they have these uh, copies here at the factory. A couple of uh, cream soup cups and century. Nice little uh, embossed uh, casserole here, some type of kitchenware. We'll look at the bottom because it has those distinctive rings that you usually see on oven serve and kitchen craft. Uh, 
And we've got some uh, plates with some underglaze uh, hand painting. Sometimes patterns that would start off as silk screens or would end up as silk screens, I should say, started their lives as something like this, where it was all hand painted to see how it would look. And they would have the information on the back, uh, what colors were used. Um, that 3520 is probably the base glaze for this plate. This comes from 1936. Nice little coronet plate, yellow uh, decal, blue trim. Has an R number, R1810. Another coronet plate. This rose and tulip, R1808. This is um, Old Roman, a square plate. This is a standard piece. Um, it's not an experimental uh, treatment. Another shop sample for Old Roman. This is OR72. And we have another... Uh, Plate from the 30s, again, uh, embossed, experimental, this time with roses. Uh, this We have hand-painted work on this one. And then we have a light green version, and the, the green version really shows the details in this piece. No information on the reverse. I thought this was kind of fun, because I'm always into decalware, and this is a uh, pastel rose or yellow rose. We see this on Yellowstone. Sometimes you can find it on Virginia Rose, but here it is on Liberty, and I, I just thought it was really strange to see this treatment on Liberty. Um, and then there are some regular Liberty treatments. Uh, that's Coronet. And we'll see this beaded plate. Let's see if there's anything on the reverse of this. Yeah, there's a glaze number, 10185. Then we have some Liberty and solid colors, which I'd never seen before. So this is gray. And these should all have uh, glaze numbers, 12, uh, 798. And then we have this nice blue, 12, 795. The green, very similar to sage green of uh, Fiesta, 12, 797. And then this rather odd, odd dark rose color, which is 12, 796. That's debutante treatment number D18. We see this rose on Georgian eggshell. Really nice uh, Duraprint treatment uh, with uh, snowflakes. So we have yellow and blue. So this is something that would have used Charm House Hollowware. So it would have either been yellow Charm House or uh, turquoise Charm House. It might have a Duraprint back stamp. It does. And it is from 1955. So we'll put these back and move on. So I want to look at some lamp bases that were made for Idealite in 1940. Put these back. And we have one here. And I believe that's model number 1400. I may be wrong. Don't quote me on that. And then there's a 1376, which is this one glazed in uh, light yellow. There were five different... Uh, lamp bases made for Idealite that did not go into production uh, and there's two of them in the morgue. This pattern is uh, called RFD. It was made using uh, rhythm flatware and then um, studio hollowware. So this, here it is in blue, very detailed pattern. And then here's another one in red. Virginia Rose Sugar Bowl hanging out. And then there's paneled plates with uh, some embossing. This one's in uh, Art Glaze Rust. And then we have Light Yellow. There's Maroon. And then there's uh, a vellum one with, uh, well, actually it's ivory. It's not vellum. Uh, the embossing is uh, hand-painted. None of these have any markings or identifications on the back. But so more than likely, because of the glazes, comes from the 30s. So it's unusual to see maroon and uh, rust on the same line. Uh, old Roman, uh, nine inch plate. You don't see too much Old Roman uh, in white. Usually it's in yellow or green. Uh, this is a null plate with unusual embossing on the rim. I'll see if I can zoom in there. And you can see that light embossing. This is a Quaker brown plate um, with some orange decoration along the rim. And a little deco tumbler. Now I've seen deco tumblers before. 
Um, this is the first one I've seen like this. It, it's almost like the Claire Loon glaze used on Jade. We see the um, the Homer Lachlan logo, um, USA. The uh, 564 you see on there is probably the glaze number. This probably comes from the early 1930s, like 1930, 31. Another experimental plate uh, with this unusual design. A more coupe shape. Usually our plates from this time period uh, have a wide rims, but this is a very narrow rim on this, almost completely coupe. So with Skytone and Suntone from the uh, 1950s, with Skytone you see the blue clay with white handle, and Suntone you see the brown clay with white handle. And this one's uh, a dark green version. So that did not go into production. Uh, some hand painted work. We got a pair of plates here. More than likely Charles Williams. Let's actually take one down and see what it says. There's nothing on the back to help us with these. Some Wells shop samples. There's our pastel tulip. We're going to look at that in a minute uh, on a snack set. And some uh, silk screen treatments on Brittany. There's an unusual combination of uh, silk screen with gold. And that's silk screen with gold as well up there. Now we have some hobnail cups. So this is the Jubilee shape. And what they did, uh, they did all these little hobnail uh, designs on these teacups. So there's different configurations. And this is part of the mold. They also made hobnail plates, but the hobnails were limited to the, the very edge of the plates. Um, of course, this did not go into production, but the standard Jubilee line did, so you will find these cups, but without all these little hobnail embossings on them. And there's a little uh, century butter dish. Rather hard piece to find. Wells green plate. I'll take a look at this one because this has got. Uh, I thought that had a Decal Products number on it. It does not. It just says five seven, five seven three. And this is a DuraPrint pattern. You normally find this on um, Liberty, especially salad bowls, but here it is on this uh, Brittany plate, which is somewhat unusual. Nineteen forty one. And then we have a harvest set. Now, this set was made for Quaker Oats, and you will either find it with Wild Rose or Pastoral or what's the other one? Um, harvest, Wild Rose, and Pastoral. Yeah, those are the three. But this one was made with uh, Courier and Ives decals. We have our reference number on that. This is just a, a blank. Another Courier and Ives decal. There's the saucer, six inch plate, again with our reference numbers, and then we see some of the underglaze pastoral standard treatments from the 1950s. Both Homer Lachlan and TST shared in that particular treatment. But the Courier and Ive decal versions did not go into production. And we've got some, uh, let's see what's here. This is Georgian eggshell with uh, experimental treatment. A spruce green plate with an embossed uh, rim. This is uh, an underglaze uh, silk screen pattern all over. This uh, also was done in red. We have this uh, blue exotic birds. Rather unusual airbrush uh, treatment with this leaf and grape uh, and yellow and green combination. Some underglaze prints, uh, it's reminiscent of uh, early American homes. We'll look at one of these, a Zodiac cup and saucer, or Zodiac cup from World's Fair. Uh, let's see, this one is Mount Vernon. We turn it over, and it's from 1940, and it says we have our R number R3405A. Rather detailed uh, prints on these. There's Independence Hall. 
done in red, green, and brown. A little Zodiac cup. Let's see what's on the back of this one. So this one has its reference number, uh, plate number 2575, August 5th, uh, 1940. Rather nice print on this one. Yet another series of uh, embossed work from the 1930s. So we see this uh, nice ivory plate with the uh, embossing hand painted, as well as the tea corresponding teacup. And then we see a yellow version with hand painted work. And then there's a light green glazed version. There's its teacup. Its saucer is right here. Then we have the snack set. And I was talking about this a moment ago, this uh, pastel rose. You see this on several shapes, Wells and, uh, let's see, Eggshell Nautilus uses it. We'll go back up to this Wells piece again. There it is. Uh, but here it is on the snack set, which uh, uses this pink-bodied clay. Uh, we have the decals with platinum trim. And when we have the snack plate and the little well for the uh, cup. Nothing on the reverse. There's also one glazed in yellow. Now I want to talk about this. This is uh, rather special. At least I think it is. This comes from August 1934. And it was made for Jewel Tea. Now, when Hall China was making autumn leaf for Jewel Tea, and they started out with a set of mixing bowls that was a teapot, sugar, and creamer. As a matter of fact, we have an undecorated blank here. This is, is what the creamer looked like. And this is their vitrified one fireware that they were using. So they approached Homer Lachlan, and when I mean they, Jewel Tea did, to make a line of dinnerware to go with this kitchenware that uh, Hall China was making. So, this is what they came up with. And it has the same radiance type embossing on it. We look at this cup and it has our reference number on the bottom. This is R4122. We have a pair of saucers. Again, with our embossing that matches the mixing bowls in the tea set from Hall China. Uh, we have our reference number on that. This is essentially the same little bit uh, different decal configuration. And then there's a dinner plate. This has no decal, but it has our embossing on it. And as we know, Homer Lachlan did not get the job. What happened instead was Hall China started making semi-vitreous dinnerware. So they made a rather elegant shape that uh, lasted not from the 30s, the 40s, 50s, 60s, all the way into the late 1970s. It was a very long-running shape. So this poses a nice question. What would have happened had Homer Lachlan made this line? Would this have been as successful? You know, because this is a very deco-styled line of dinnerware. I don't know if it would have been as popular as the more classic uh, style done by Hall China in the 50s and 60s because this is, there's nothing very there's nothing mid-century modern about this um, but it is an interesting uh, thing to think about what would have happened you know you've got Fiesta and Autumn Leaf two of the most popular recognized lines of dinnerware what would it have been like for both of them to be made under the same roof um, but this little cup and saucer and the plate it gives us a little hint of what could have been so I think these are rather special pieces here in the morgue all right, moving on. We'll look at some uh, blue art glazes. Because those of you who collect art glazes, you know there's four. You've got your rust, um, you've got rose, green, and melon yellow. Well, they did try to make a blue version for several years, and we have an apple tree bowl in this uh, art glaze blue. It's a very matte glaze. We see the uh, Homer Lachlan logo on the bottom. And then there is the Century Batter Jug Base, again, in this rather splotchy art glaze. We'll see an ashtray in a minute that's also in this blue art glaze. And then we have Modern Farmer in light green, sugar in uh, Harlequin yellow. A couple more art glaze trials, this time on Virginia Rose batter jugs.
from the early 1930s. Virginia Rose was first modeled in 1932 and introduced in 1933. So now we'll look at some broken edge pieces, and that's how Frederick Reed described them. And, and there's evidence to suggest that these were inspired by um, pieces made by Wedgwood. I'm trying to get out of the light so I don't cast a shadow. And we have another one in this uh, pink glaze. Serenade pink, actually. We'll move a couple pieces. We can look at a decaled version. This one doesn't have a, a rim. This is more coupe shape. That one does have a rim. So there are variations. There's our reference number, 3080A. Here's one in Serenade Blue. It's a really nice coronet uh, treatment here with all this uh, hand painting done on the embossing. And another embossed plate with this scalloped edge and fluting going on in the rim. And this one is uh, from 1934. So that uh, HOM4313 I'm sure is the uh, yellow coloring Underglaze yellow, 1934. That looks very much like uh, Frederick Reed's right handwriting. So we'll put these back. So this comes from 1939. These are the quote unquote broken edge uh, pieces. A little yellow stone plate in this uh, green glaze with tulips. We have a glaze number on the back, B20, B239. And a rather unusual Brittany treatment in that we've got this gold stamp on the silk screen, which you don't see that too often. A reference number on that one. And this is from 1940. Now, there's a series of plates here with all these lines and beads. And this comes from 1937. So we'll go through these very quickly. There's a, a pink, there's a brown. I'm sure these have glaze, all of them have these glaze numbers on the back. So you see these different lines and beads. Some of them are small beads, some of them are large. And the shape is somewhat convex. There's a yellow version. Oh, this is, this is something completely different. That's just a, an embossed uh, rim plate. But these uh, lines and beads, which again were made in 1937, they abandoned them and instead made swing eggshell, which is just a plain convex shape. But before doing so, they made all these different trials. That actually has a model number on it, but it's hard to see. Again, there's your beads and lines. But it's amazing just how many versions they did come up with. And again, let me get out of the light. There's light green. There's serenade blue with a more squared edge to it. There's a brown glaze. Some with a little fan detail. There's a lime green. Again, these all have glaze numbers on them. But this is somewhat of a precursor to swing eggshell. Now, 1941, and we have the fruit skin glazes. There's quite a bit of ex uh, examples to show. Uh, because Homer Lachlan worked on this line extensively throughout 1941 for Sears and Roebuck. And they just could not satisfy the customer. And the main issue with this line had to do with the specs that are in the glaze. So I'll show uh, a couple examples so you can see. This green example has very light specs. 
Whereas this example, it's very heavy. So they could not control the consistency. And I, I, from what I understand, that's true of any time you're dealing with a speckled glaze. Um, but this was rather extensive. And they had a lot of pieces in this line that you normally don't see with other dinnerware lines. For example, there were cracker trays. These may even have their model numbers on them. Yeah, it does. 1618. Of course, you have the oval bakers. There was also a divided baker. They tried to satisfy them with uh, different styles of cups. So we see this is the typical um, fruit skin glaze cup, but they also made one with uh, a ring handle. They made some with these pedestal feet. And we see all the different types of glazes here. They also made uh, these footed bowls. So we have the uh, rope embossing towards the bottom. Or, alternately, we have the rope embossing at the top. But that's one common feature for all these pieces, is this rope embossing. And I would mentioned this when we were looking at those hand-painted plates. Because when this line did not succeed, they started trying to do other things. And that's why you see those hand-painted plates we looked at earlier. Um, there's your rope embossing. And they basically borrow this idea from Craft Blue, which has a rim. But this is a coupe shape. So all these have glaze numbers on the bottom. There's a yellow. Cookie jar, rather unusual piece. Again with this green fruit skin glaze. Their little pedestal foot. And then we have our fruit bowls with a rope embossing. They even tried to change the embossing uh, and that didn't work. They went for this more zigzag type embossing on this fruit skin glaze piece. So you have various sizes of plates. You've got the fruit bowls. You've got these unusual footed bowls. They made the meat platters again, sort of like those Georgian eggshell oven serve. Or, I'm sorry, Georgian oven serve platters that catch the grease. But these are the fruit skin glaze versions. These covered soups with their liners. These all have the indentions. And then they made these fruit bowls and salad bowls. They made them low profile. They made them high. Uh, rather large bowls. But this was just not meant to be. Um, and it's a shame because this would have been one of Frederick Reed's uh, last lines. It was, and of course, Liberty was his last shape. Um, but he worked rather extensively. The whole art department did on this line, and it just did not happen. So again, fruit skin glazes for Sears and Roebuck. And we have some octagon plates, um, very similar to Yellowstone, except we have these uh, little embossed edges to them. Flight of the Swallows, we usually see that on the well shape. Uh, let's see, some Brittany plates up at the top. Old Roman, that's OR73 shop sample. Coronet, CO63 shop sample, that's the embossing in uh, blue. This is rather interesting, this is Priscilla, which uh, you see... Um, on eggshell nautilus and kitchen craft you also see it on modern farmer and liberty um, but here it, they're testing the decals by putting all these multiple sprigs all over the plate and uh, here's orleans unusual scallop shape and vellum with this uh, nice colorful decal uh, underglaze silk screen with a decal combination on Brittany, a georgian plate another hand painted piece we might have some information on this let's see what this says and it says a uh, lily pattern, I believe, at the top. Uh, number 2691, October 15th, uh, 1940, C.W. Charles Williams. And then it has the uh, color combinations that were used for the painting. And then there's some Ravenna shop samples. RV27, RV47, RV49. Trellis. Um, we see this. We saw this on that uh, Noel Bridge casserole. We also see this on the well shape. As, but here's his trellis on this light yellow glaze with T8028. There's RV34 and RV1043. Uh, Orleans trellis with a poppy decal. Another trellis. Noel shape. This one is Noel. I've never seen this particular pattern before. This uh, rather unusual orange and black 
This is uh, N2423 from 1927. It's a very early null shape. And there's another Old Roman piece, OR54. Very difficult line to find Old Roman. And then there's some more shop samples. This is Ravenna and Orleans at the top. Uh, some more Ravenna. Just pan through them. There's some Orleans. Nice tulip decal on that 060. There's 052. Again, we see this uh, Flowers of the Dell, I believe they're called. Trellis and Ravenna. And we have RV36. This is the same as JJ59, which was used on Virginia Rose. So there are more uh, Ravenna and Orleans at the top. Another row of Ravenna plates, all from the early 1930s. 025, the uh, colorful poppy decal on Orleans. And here we see uh, JJ59. We saw it on uh, Ravenna up top on RV36, and here it is on 019, though you will find it on Virginia Rose more often. Uh, 028 and 027, some more Orleans. And we have uh, some scallop plates in vellum with decals, experimentals. Rather unusual um, coronet teacup in this uh, mauve blue or harlequin blue glaze. And then we have the uh, filigree teacups. This one's in a blue body and this one's in ivory. Uh, let's see, this is a Rust Wells Art Glaze with the Fiji decal. This decal was used by uh, Hall China and, uh, let's see, Taylor Smith & Taylor, so it would have been available to any pottery that wanted to use it. But here it is, it's rather unusual on this uh, Wells Art Glaze Rust. So now, with these creamers and sugars, we're looking at about 1944, and this was an attempt to uh, make... Uh, fine china or translucent ware. In fact, let's grab one of these creamers. We'll go over to this light and you can see that it's translucent. So this is about 1944. Of course it did not go into production but they did make a full line. They made plates and saucers and cups and here we've got several styles of sugars and their creamers. And then we have this white-bodied ware. Um, this comes from about, I think this is 1943. And then they made an embossed version. So you're looking at pieces that were made between the time of Frederick Reed and Don Schreckengost. So we'll go on to the shell plates. So this is 1938. Um, these come up from time to time in light green and, and Fiesta Red. Here's one in turquoise and there's one in Fiesta Red. Uh, rather unusual to see one with decals. And it has its R number on the back. So R2635. Then we've got a little collection of ashtrays here. So here's a Fiesta ashtray and it says, let's see, the brass rail, well, now let's start over. Meet and eat at the Brass Rail, Youngstown, Ohio. That's an early version. Fiesta, old ivory ashtray, Harlequin gray basket weave ashtray. And here's a couple from 1931, and I believe these did go into production because I have seen this version before uh, on eBay. This one I haven't, um, but it does have the 1931 back stamp on it instead of like a, a glaze number or a reference number. So it's a nice uh, scalloped edge with this inside um, embossing. And then you see the one with the daisies. This is one I've seen before. And this is marked 1931 as well. Little lug handled dish from Century. And some uh, deco ashtrays. Sometimes these are called oven serve ashtrays, sometimes they're called kitchen craft. They were actually from 1931 as well as the other ones we saw. So they're, they predate both oven serve and kitchen craft. I just call them deco ashtrays. This is your first version where the rings mimic 
the rings that are uh, on the edge. And so you see how the spacing is different from the second version where they are very widely spaced from the center. So this is Wells Art Glaze Rust. You can see the back stamp there. And this is that blue art glaze we were, I was talking about a moment ago when we looked at Century in the Apple Tree Bowl. We've got some, let's see, these are the uh, Made in Japan basket weave nut dishes. And then here are the Harlequin versions that were made for Woolworths in maroon. Shell cup and saucer. Let's see, we might have a model number on one of these. We don't. There's maroon. There's uh, Harlequin blue. And we have this unusual tan body with this embossing. Uh, Flower Frog. I'm not sure if this is Homer Lachlan or not, but it, it, the turquoise glaze seems to match, so I, I put it out here. There are a lot of pieces in this room that are in bins on, on the floor that uh, are not Homer Lachlan. You know, the art department would often buy things for research and development, and uh, this very well may come from another pottery. I'm just not 100% sure, but I wanted to put it out there just in case. These Georgian candlesticks come from 1935. It's model 463. It has our little uh, Georgian embossing on it. There were two styles made. This is the shorter version. These are Ivora candlesticks, model number 442 from 1935. The handled version is modeled, um, let's see, that's number 504 from 1935. Going to jump to the uh, Stein mugs. These are in uh, some experimental art glazes with this great border. This is a pretty early piece in the modeling log. It's model number 29. And I've seen these before in uh, leaf green, the art glaze green, but this is some uh, experimental art glazes. I wanted to show a piece in here. Because this is carnival, and this is what we would expect with the line that was made for Quaker Oats. But before they made this version with the, the rings on the edge, they made a version with these flutes. So there's a, a cup with the flutes in the bottom. There's the saucer, as you see with the flutes towards the well. There's also a fluted six-inch plate. Um, but before they made any other pieces, they switched to the uh, more familiar version. So this is an experimental um, or an alternate. This is model number uh, 985 from 1937. And then of course they decided to go with the ringed version. Probably because of the popularity of Fiesta. And then we have the, um, the festoon cups. So there's... They might have the model numbers. I thought they did. Maybe they don't. They do not. So we have the straight handled version. We have a curved or a more standard handle. This is in blue body as you would see in craft blue. There's some detail of the saucer. So this is a time when Homer Lachlan's making all these different cups and saucers to try to appeal to Quaker Oats for premiums. We're going to see some in a moment. Dork and uh, Peachtree. Another standard handle. The two-handled version is modeled, uh, model number uh, 504, and this comes from 1935. So, these mouth ewers are salesman samples, and they came from George Washington Clark, who was a sales rep for Homer Lachlan. He died, I believe, in 1913 in Denver, Colorado. Um, but these are cut in half. And this was done so that they could uh, carry a bunch of samples with them rather than have a whole bunch of bulky pitchers. And they have the treatment numbers on them. For example, this one is 2328, this one's 2294, and so forth. So this is the Duchess shape that you see here. There are others we're going to look at in a moment. There's some uh, experimental child's bowls. You see the Homer Lachlan logo on the bottom. Here's one in a, an art glaze. Okay. 
And we've got some tongue twisters. These come from 1941. Uh, I've only pulled a couple of them out. There are several here. Um, this is the Tumbler. Tongue Twister Tableware by Homer Lachlan. And each one will have a, a little tongue twister on it. The mug says, uh, Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppercorns. And there he is. And there's your marking, tongue twister tableware. There's a green one over here, I believe. Let's see, yeah. It has the same. And there's your marking. Here's a series of custards that were made, uh, different types of embossing going on. Uh, a lot of these views were, were for glaze samples, so we see a lot of glaze numbers on the bottom. Uh, egg and dart plate. Now the egg and dart plates uh, come from 1936. So we have one in yellow, and there's one in turquoise. We have a muffin plate in serenade blue. And then there are several uh, plates from Riviera and these uh, experimental glazes. So we'll look at one of them. This is sort of a brownish color, and it has the number 1294 on the back. So each of these are going to have their glaze numbers. There's a, a golden color, sort of a sage. Now at the top, well, first we'll talk about this. This is a, a scallop plate. That's done in French rose and art glaze. Now these tango pieces, and you see this one, the first one is slightly different uh, in spruce green than the standard uh, harlequin blue one on the right. So when Frederick Reed was making these plates, he noted in the modeling log as well as his notes, uh, he calls it a Swedish plate. Well, in, in going through pieces in the, uh, in the morgue, I was able to find a couple and here's one. They're in really bad condition. They're unusual body of clay. It almost feels like Majolica. Um, but they are marked um, made in Sweden. And you see this one that's in spruce green, which is essentially the Swedish plate. So that's what he's talking about. Tango is essentially a copy of Swedish dinnerware. And if we look at the others, the harlequin blue, the spruce green, and the uh, yellow. I don't have a maroon one up here. But those are the same as this one. And if we look at the back of this one, it says Sweden. So both the experimental tango and the regular tango plates are based on Swedish dinnerware. The hollowware is not, but the flatware is. And we have a scallop uh, shape with this uh, etched design going on in yellow. And there's pink, and there's this, uh, well, this is just whiteware with a decal, given a clear glaze, I believe. Uh, this was almost a fully realized line. There, there are several sizes of plates and berry bowls and soup bowls. I couldn't find a sugar and creamer to go with this line. Um, but this looks like something that they worked a lot on, and it just didn't happen. And this is a jade plate with a really nice rose decal and uh, gold trim. Ski mugs. Um, let's see, where do the, the ski mugs come from 1938, if I'm not mistaken. I'm trying to remember. And we have reference numbers on these. The only difference between these treatments is one has the red line and one does not. And they made several different styles and shapes of ski mugs. We see one uh, in Fiesta light green, and there's an, an odd handled version in red. Uh, so they made quite a few of these. So I, I would assume these were meant for ski lodges for like hot chocolate or some other beverages. Let's see, what else? Well, we've got the uh, rope handled mugs, or jugs, I should say. Um, we've got melon yellow, and then we've got some with decals. These come from the 1930s, or late 1930s. Some deco styled teapots. I have no information on these whatsoever, but they, they this is uh, the orange glaze that was used by Homer Lachlan, uh, an oven serve. They have no model numbers on them. And then we've got the three footed casseroles. So we'll look at the, this is melon yellow, and this one's uh, orange or pumpkin. I put that down carefully. We'll look at the little three feet. 
So neither of these went into production, of course. Some more custards. Uh, some Wells Arc glazes. Some of these are standard production pieces back in here. Uh, some egg cups, except this egg cup. This is an experimental. Uh, we have a model number on there. It's hard to read. 631, I believe. But the other egg cups, like the Wells egg cup, the Jubilee egg cup, cable egg cup, they're all pretty standard. We have some more of these half mouth ewers, Wyoming shape, Mingo shape, and bridle. Again, cut in half so you could take multiple pieces on the road and not be bogged down with a whole bunch of pottery. So this is called um, rib flutes and crossed and pressed cups and saucers. And they come from 1936. So the cup is model number 710, the saucer is number 711. So we have a spruce green version. And then we have a vellum. And then there's the saucer and, and ivory. No other pieces were made for this line, just the cups and saucers. Same is true for this uh, pleated one. Nice vellum teacup. This is model 708. And there's a saucer in maroon. I think there's one underneath. There is. That's in just plain whiteware. From 1930s, of course. And then we've got the art glaze sort of melon type cups. There's a pair of them. Okay, moving on, um, we have some more of the ship treatments that I talked about before. We see various uh, ships with these, uh, this has the shell border, this has the roses, this has florals. Each one of them is going to be marked uh, with their treatment. San Martin, famous old ships, has its reference number. And we have some Brittany examples. A lot of Brittany examples were made and, and kept in the uh, morgue. Some lilac fiesta being stored. And this is a rather ambitious piece. And there are two of them here. One of them is an orange, or pumpkin if you will, from oven serve, and then the other one's an ivory. So there are three pieces to this casserole. So first you have the lid, which doubles as a pie plate. So you take the lid off, and you have a pie plate. Then you have the insert, which is a three-piece uh, nappy. And then you have the base, which is your casserole. And we'll look at the bottom, too, because the embossing goes all the way to the other side. And if you look closely, you can see the Sager pin marks, or the little tripod that was uh, used in firing. So this is, uh, comes from the early 1930s. The base is model 193. The, um, the lid is um, model 194. So that's your pie plate lid. And then this is 195, your divided nappy. The ivory one is very similar. The only difference is, instead of this little uh, three-pronged handle, it's a triangle. But everything else is the same. Really nice embossing detail on both pieces. Little uh, Century Gravy Fast Stand, standard item. Couple 36's bowls, Virginia Rose and Harlequin. Unusual donut coffee set. So we'll look at the cup. It says Dunking cup, patent applied for, so it's an oval shape, so you can dunk your donut in there. In fact, it has a donut embossed on the side. And then you've got this little plate where you stick your donut on the plate. No other markings. Some hand-painted plates. These would have gone on to become uh, silkscreen designs had they been approved. So we have all the information on the back. Uh, these come from 1936. So you see pink and gray, that's the colors that were used 
uh, to create the, the pattern on that one. Again, we've got pink and dark green. So we have a whole series of these treatments that did not go into production. However, this one did. This is an actual production piece that was used on Brittany when it was introduced, I believe 1936 is when Brittany came out. Uh, Ironstone coffee pot, original Fiesta coffee pot in black. When I say original, I mean in 1986 they used the original mold. So it's not the restyled version. Uh, let's see. These were rather interesting to find because I, I'm a Virginia Rose enthusiast and I had no idea that these existed. They're little footed nappies. And they're dated, this one's 1932, which is when Fiesta, or Fiesta, which is when Virginia Rose was first modeled. So we see these variations. Let's see another one in art glaze. No marking, but this is the Virginia Rose uh, footed nappy. We have another one here that's dated 1933. So that might be something to watch out for if they ever show up um, because these are marked as if they were produced. You know, there's no R numbers or glaze numbers or anything else. And what's even more unusual, there's a lid. So casseroles in Virginia Rose are, are oval and here we have a nice round lid that fits these nappies. And we have this handled version. This is from 1932. And there's your Virginia Rose embossing. So this was rather unexpected, this little handled salad nappy and with the lid and then these others with the feet and different sizes. Uh, some more Brittany examples. Another one with hand painted details. This one might have some information in the back. It does. This is from 1936. We see our colors that are used. The 3520 is our base color. And we have um, underglaze print on Orleans. These are standard, by the way. The, this is uh, chintz on coronet. Um, this is unusual. It's got the um, embossing of this rather deco bird on swing eggshell and little uh, gold stars on blue circles on Georgian eggshell. Another Brittany piece, uh, the decal is unremarkable, but the, the uh, silk screen is interesting. It's got alternating silk screen patterns and then they have these gold stamps on them as well. There's a lot going on with this particular treatment. Orbit shaped teapot, not very easy to find. There's actually two of them in the morgue. Uh, some Fiesta carafes. Uh, we see some more experimental plates. There are tons of experimental plates. Maybe, maybe another time we can go through these. And we'll move on down. Here's a piece from 1944. Kitchen craft mixing bowl, the smallest size with this etched design. And it is marked 1944. I don't know if you can see that. So even the foot in the uh, upper rim has got some etching going on. Theme eggshell with an unusual decal. And we see more etching on these plates. Uh, we see spruce green and we see uh, harlequin blue. Uh, this is probably inspired by these as well. These, the blue willow type etching. This was done by Payton City and this was clearly Homer Lachlan's attempt to try to do their own version. So there are quite a few examples in here. We've got a brown, we've got yellow, har this blue which is very similar to harlequin blue. A pair of Kenilworth, oh, this one's dirty, um, coffee bottles in harlequin yellow and some bisque George Washington mugs these were made for the New York World's Fair these have model numbers on them so we'll look at these very quickly this one is 1374 B and this one is 1374 A and this one, this is a really unusual one because it's got kind of a fat face. Um, 
he is 1372. So I know there are some World Fair collectors out there who probably like to see those. Um, some more experimental plates. Rather nice examples uh, because they're decals on uh, different solid color dinnerware. Again, we get to see what could have been. There's Old Roman. There's your Roman pheasant, OR78. Another Old Roman. Really fun line to collect, but it's so hard to find. OR52. OR53. There's a trellis shop sample. And another trellis, T45. Okay, so now I want to talk about a triangle shape. So we're going to pull this piece down. Because before jade was made, and that was 1932, after century and before jade, they had considered making this triangle shape. Uh, we see one here in this uh, art glaze rust. No identification marks on the back. There's another one that has a decal treatment and some trim on the verge. And it's also in rust. And then we see the triangle saucer again in rust. But instead of doing a triangle shape, they switch to a square shape and they make jade. So there, there are only a few pieces of the triangle shape here. And I'm not sure what happened to this. This is a uh, centuries vellum glaze, but something reacted with it to give it this uh, really odd uh, fruit skin effect, almost like an orange peel. It's from 1944. I don't know if that was intentional or not. It, it almost looks intentional. Then there are some etched plates. So this is uh, a Brittany plate with some etching detail going on. So whenever they do it in solid colors, it brings the etching to life. Some of them are very detailed. Here we see uh, Georgian eggshell with tulip. More Georgian eggshell. This one's rather hard to see, but it, it's a great pattern. This is a wheat pattern on Georgian eggshell. Again, very hard to see. Nice stylized flower. Acorn. And another flower. I don't know if that's going to show up or not. And a couple scallop plates. Um, this is an art glaze brown, or rust I should say. Uh, a lot of molded relief going on here. Really, really nice piece. And then here's one in art glaze green, a different design. Then there are a series of uh, glaze on glaze plates. So these all have identification numbers on the reverse. Really nice hand-painted work going on with these. None of them are dated, though, I would imagine, 1930s, because the base color looks like Harlequin Blue. Again, nice hand-painting work going on with this one. So this is a little bit different than what we saw with our crystalline glazes. This is, this is all glaze on glaze. Oh, this is nice. This is kiln trash. So this is Fiesta Red that was fired too high. And you get this brown effect. You fire it high enough, it turns completely brown. at the end, so we'll just keep going. Well, 
That's a nice one too. Okay. So we've got some Genesee shot plates. These come from about oh, 1912 or so. Again, it's unusual to see older pieces uh, in the morgue. Usually things are from, as I said before, 20s through the 50s. There are some 60s and 70s in here. Uh, Canadian Club jug, one of several that was made. Uh, I can't remember the year offhand, it's in the 1960s. Medium green Fiesta mugs, some Quaker pieces. Uh, FDR model, this is uh, for an FDR mug that was made in about 1933 or 34, I believe. Some standard casseroles, we've got uh, Rhythm, Republic, Virginia Rose, uh, Republic, so this is a Republic covered dish, and this is the casserole. And a Republic jug. Some more pieces of Republic. Now, I thought this was a rather important piece because we see all these pieces of oven serve that are hitting the market with this uh, white stone glaze. But none of them have date codes in them. They're all marked. They either have these kitchen craft stickers or they'll have the Homer Lachlan marking on them. This is the only piece I've ever found that has a date code. And it, it gives us an idea when this was made. And it's, you probably can't make it out, but it's 1955. So it finally answers the question as to when this white stone oven syrup was made. Or pepper, as uh, Joe Cunningham called it. And I wanted to focus on these for a moment because these all come from 1927. These would have been some of the first pieces that Frederick Reed worked on when he came to Homer Lachlan. So we'll look at some of these plates because these are his notes on the reverse. So he's, he's specifying the, uh, the glaze numbers that were used. Rather odd rose glaze. Then we see more hand-painted work, and we'll look at a couple of these because it says October 1927. So he came here, I believe it was August of 1927. Nice one with orcas on it. October 1927. We'll just go through these very quickly. Frederick Reed stayed with Homer Lachlan until he died in 1942. We're going to look at some of these rather detailed chargers that he made when he first came to Homer Lachlan as well. We see this one Try to capture that embossing. There's your uh, exotic bird decal. And on the back it says Homer Lachlan 1929. There's a few of these. Again with that embossing. Uh, this green hand painted work with uh, gold tracings and decal. A lot going on with this one. There's one in uh, depression yellow glaze. Nice gold edge. Unusual blue hand painting work. And finally we have this scorpion. So I assume that's a zodiac sign. Might have been a whole series of them at one time. And whatever he wrote on the back is faded. And then we have some, I believe these are Nautilus. Let's see, are these Nautilus? Or, yeah, these are regular Nautilus shop samples. I'll just leap through these very quickly. M441. You'll see that decal on a Cavalier eggshell. M430. M440. This is a treatment for Woolworths, I believe. Yes. W. 
535. That used Empress Hollowware. There's a Brittany treatment, another Brittany treatment. So now we'll look at Encore. Encore is an unusual shape from the late 1960s. It was, uh, has this square base and this round body. So you have this odd combination going on. So this is your pepper shaker. There's your salt shaker. A coffee pot. I'll take this down so I don't break anything. Nice finial to that. So we have this bulbous body, but then we turn it upside down. And it transforms into this square base. There's also a teacup. So this would have went with uh, Triumph flatware. There was a, a casserole and sauce boat and sugar and creamer made. I mean, it was a full line, though I've never seen any of it out there. The only pieces I've seen are the ones you're seeing right now on the video here at the morgue. Oh, uh, let's see. I'm going to pull this out. This is a trellis plate in blue with a really nice uh, print. There's no, it, well, there's a, a glaze number, but it really doesn't tell us anything else about this particular piece. Probably the nicest piece of trellis I've ever seen. And then we've got some unusual Harlequin plates. These are in pastel glazes with some hand-painted work, presumably for silkscreen uh, approval. So I'll just pan around and show you these real quick. Some of these are lime green, some of these are a very uh, like a lemon yellow. We'll look at the back of one because I'm sure there's information. Yeah, so it's talking about the glazes. 3509 would be your base glaze. Then you've got your green and brown that's being used for this uh, hand-painted work. This is a really unusual, t this is like a purple. Or li it actually says lilac. No, it doesn't. Mulberry. And of course, you know, they did not decorate Harlequin, but again, you know, the whole point is to, to see what could have been. And then we have a whole series of our craft shape, our, our, our rim shape with the rope. Um, and here it is in craft blue with these hand painted designs. Here it is in whiteware with uh, this eagle. And we see another bird here. We see a flower pot. And we see a plaid design, a ship. Now, these did go in production. This was uh, hand painted peasant wear, so you see the windmill in the house. So that's on a tan body. These others did not, however, so you've got a southwestern theme uh, tulip, turkey, another flower vase, uh, and a turkey and a pilgrim, so a Thanksgiving scene. So all these did not go into production except for the one with the house and the windmill. All the others are experimental. This is a piece of decorated specialties. So this comes from 1903. It's called an Alaskan ice cream. I don't know if you can see the embossing. Probably not. This gold stamp's covering it pretty good. Uh, order of railway construct conductors. Souvenir to visit to the Homer Lachlan China Company, East Liverpool, Ohio, May 15th, 1903. Uh, some 14 and a half inch pasta bowls with uh, airbrush technique to create these decorations. I don't have space to show them all, so I'm just going to show you the second one. A tulip design. I put the best one on top, by the way. So here we have peach tree and dork. These were made for Quaker Oats. This is your standard peach tree cup and saucer. But we also have uh, an example that was done in the craft blue clay. And then here is one. This is a little bit taller, so you have, let's see if I can put them together. You've got the short version, and then you've got the tall version. Again, your craft blue clay, which is non-standard. Your peach tree saucer. And then this is dork. And dork should be marked as such. Let's see if we've got a good marking here. So those were made for Quaker Oats. Uh, 1936. show this face. I, I thought there were two of these in here. There, I thought there was one in blue, but here's one in green. And you can barely make it out, but it has the, it says Homer Lachlan on the bottom. I don't think you're going to be able to see it, but 
rather interesting uh, piece of artware. And I'm going to move these over. This is just some standard Fiesta relish base and a Harlequin salad bowl. Um, Fiesta 7-inch plate, which has been hand-decorated. Unusual marking on the back. If that even may be a depiction of Frederick Reed himself. And then we have this cobalt chop plate with an unusual uh, platinum treatment on the verge. So I'll move this back over. And some century shop samples. So I'll just pan around and you can see the different century treatments with their treatment numbers. At MS22, that stands for MS Sellers, who was based, they were based out of uh, Washington State, if I'm not mistaken, somewhere out west. They were a major distributor for Homer Laughlin in the 1930s. C4 English Garden, which is a very popular treatment on Century. These are Rokai jugs. Uh, this one's in Cobalt. And this one's in uh, Harlequin Blue. A nice theme eggshell casserole and uh, oven serve. Uh, eggshell Nautilus, although this pink glaze is on the exterior, so the in inside's white. So this is a uh, daisy chain, which with a daisy chain oven serve, we see this with decals and metal holders sometimes, but this is unusual in that it has these handles. It, it shouldn't have handles on it, so that's a prototype. And speaking of prototypes, we're going to look at Harlequin. Because in 1936, when they made Harlequin for Woolworths, and we'll look at a piece of Harlequin very quickly. So that's Fiesta Red, and there's Light Green. Those are your standard Harlequin pieces. But there were alternates with these variations in rings and these embossings you see the, the spacing is almost fiesta like than, rather than harlequin and we have all these little uh, whimsical embossings going on on the ball as they call it there's one in brown and turquoise we'll zoom in a little bit then we have a spruce green version with harlequin rings and the, these uh, eight divisions with these little tulips there's Harlequin yellow. And then there's a Harlequin blue version with these little leaves. Or leaves, I should say. So those are some alternates that were under consideration when the Harlequin was being developed for Woolworths. Our uh, bead and line plates, we saw those earlier. There's a couple more examples there. More kiln trash. This I'd mentioned this earlier, when you have Fiesta Red and you fire it too high, it burns up. And I learned that from TS&T when uh, researching Vistosa, because that happened to their red glaze often, where you would get this effect if the temperature was up a little too high. There's our hot water pitcher in uh, Rose Ebony. Can't find the lid, it might be here somewhere. Hearthside Sugar and Creamer in Amberstone Glaze for Raindrops. Um, Chamber of Commerce Dinnerware on the Quaker shape. This is not terribly hard to find uh, in this blue pattern. So they have quite a number of pieces here. This made, I believe, 1927, um, and we've got the blue example here, but they also have a, an alternative in green, which I've never seen before. So that is a nice little uh, thing to find. Chateau Buffet was a line made for Quaker Oats by Homer Laughlin and TS&T. In fact, here's a TS&T version, Taylor Smith and Taylor. So it's this brown clay with this blue interior. Well, what Homer Laughlin did as some sample pieces is they took their oven serve and they made it in white and did a blue interior. So we have a couple pieces of this Chateau Buffet-esque oven serve that could have been made for Quaker Oats but did not happen of course there we go genuine oven serve um, 
Fiesta juice tumblers, uh, there's several different models that were made for Kraft cheese. This was the first one that was made for Kraft cheese, and it was based on a glass model that Kraft had sent in. And this is model number 845 from uh, June of 1937. So they wanted these ceramic versions, uh, and instead they started making all these different ones um, with these Fiesta type rings on it. Um, the HLCCA's book on Fiesta, there, there's a good write up on all the different models that were made uh, for Kraft cheese, but these eventually go on to become uh, part of the Fiesta juice sets. So I think we will look at some Fiesta pie plates and then wrap this up. There's so much that we could look at, and I could really go on and on and on, but I think we need to wrap this up. So we're going to look at some of these um, pie plates, these contemporary Fiesta pie plates, with these treatments. Some of these did go into production, some of them did not. So we have this uh, chicken pot pie. Some of these probably were made for uh, Betty Crocker. It's a periwinkle one with snowflakes. There's one with a heart. Candy cane. Another pot pie, this time with a cow. Cherry pie with the chairs. The snowman. North Pole. Christmas wreath. Candle. Shoe fly pie with shoes. Spruce green with snowflakes. I think that actually did go into production. Um, Happy Holidays with the Golden Bells. This is a real nice one with the ribbon and bow. Mom's Fiesta Apple Pie. And the Snowman. So I think it's good to stop there for now. Um, I want to thank Shannon and Katie and Liz and everyone else at the Fiesta Tableware Company for this opportunity. I have to say as a collector, as a researcher, um, as a Nulli, it has been an honor and a privilege to spend time in this room and to share all this with you today. Um, so that's going to be it for now.